Hi folks, you with Tacitus today at your pushback channel and thank you for joining us. Um, in this essay I'd like to talk about colonialism and Christopher Columbus and Christopher Columbus Day. Now, the uh, I remember when I first started visiting the, the United States, as a, um, this was in the 1980s, uh, the uh, Columbus Day was considered well, certainly where I was moving around, it was considered to be uh, something of an important day in the, the, the wider history of the Americas and uh, something to be celebrated, proud of, all that sort of stuff. Um, politicians were over-exploiting it for the Italian-American angle, but, but nonetheless, it was something that was seen in most places quite, uh, quite positively. There were some of the more radical journals of the day would pour scorn on it, uh, but those people that pour scorn from the sidelines, they seem to be in the majority now, or, or at least being amplified by the, the globalists. So let's have a look at colonialism as a, as a general thing, given that that's, that's getting a, a lot of bad press and has done for a little while. The, the general thing is that um, the, the bad, evil, wicked white folks invaded the, uh, the places that were um, uh, nirvana paradises, um, they were uh, perfect places, living in perfect harmony with nature. Everybody was, was playing sweet music and, and uh, holding hands and, and that sort of thing. But um, that's absurd, it never was like that. Uh, and the idea that the whites stole the land and, and these sorts of things, that also is, is a bit of a tough tough gig to push so looking at colonialism uh, from the time it, it began it was typically to, to set up trading posts there was no real consideration of taking land that the sole purpose was trade and particularly uh, it, it, given the European maritime activity starting with people like Christopher Columbus and then the uh, the Portuguese particularly the Portuguese in the earlier days you know Magellan guys like that um, the the idea of of, um, of this of the risk uh, and and the traveling was looking for a way round um, uh, the the Middle East to the Far East, particularly to gain um, you know, access to the spice trade and and the silk trade and so on. This was something that was controlled by the the Arabs in in the Ottoman Empire at the time. Um, so that whole transit road bringing bringing goods from the east uh, and, and bringing them across to the west that was that was completely controlled by the the ottoman arabs and they were making huge markups on this and and for goods going back the other way and the ottoman empire became quite rich you know because of this this silk road um, uh, the, the duties and the, the levies and just the fact of caravan moving along. Some of them were quite large with hundreds of pack animals and so these animals had to be fed and watered and uh, that came at a price. And so uh, all these, these towns and cities along the way of the Silk Road did very nicely thank you out of this trade. So the Europeans wanted to break this monopoly that the, the Arabs had and wanted to find a way this is on the sea to, to get round to Asia, which um, which they did. Now, initially, Christopher Columbus, as a case in point, was looking for that way around, um, but instead um, discovered the uh, you know the Caribbean area. Um, other uh, other uh, seafarers, of course, discovered the Vasco da Gama. You know the list goes on. Um, discovered the uh, uh, the route around um, Africa uh, to get to to get to Asia. Um, and this included, of course, India and China and um, the Indonesian Spice Islands, the Philippines and, and uh, Japan and so on. So w these original um, uh, seafarers, they were looking for uh, trade to set up trade relationships. They weren't looking to settle land or, or do anything like that. That wasn't on the on the uh, on the radar initially. Now, when they came to, to these um, typically sparsely inhabited but huge continents uh, and they saw all this very fertile arable land, they saw vast uh, resources uh, um, 
on the land, uh, things that were of value to Europeans, but were of no value at all to to the natives of these various places, then they thought, oh, wow, you know, this, this land's being unused. These people aren't cultivating on any, any either at all or on any scale. They're mostly hunter-gatherers. Um, so uh, given the land's unused, we can surely, we can put it to some use and grow crops and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, run, run cattle and so on. Um, so this is... This is what they did. And they went and made agreements with the local natives. And the, the natives were hunter-gatherers, nomadic. They would move around. They, they may be in an area this year, but it may be years before they would come back to the area as, as nomadic peoples. So the, the uh, Europeans would give them some, some you know, iron axes or, or uh, advanced you know, things that are made from what would advance European technology of the day. And the, the natives would have been happy with that. So, yeah, hey, you can have that, that bit of land there. That's no problem. Now, there were some, some, uh, there were some uh, um, reasons for believing that conflict would take place because nearly all these peoples that the Europeans were encountering didn't have private ownership or contract law um, or property law or anything like that. So the idea of owning land as in someone owns it because um, that's the only reason they'll invest their time and energy and money into it. Um, this concept of ownership wasn't something that they had. They didn't have that sort of investment of time and energy. Things were shared communally or, or to some extent. And But each society would steal from another native tribal society. But their own community, they were quite... Um, they were tribal in the sense of uh, communal sharing. So the, their concept of ownership didn't, didn't really exist in, in the same way as it did in Europe. Similarly, even though they've accepted payment for the land, uh, when they decided to come back to a few years later, they, uh, as, as nomads, they would say, no, we're going we're gonna to take it back now. And the Europeans would say, hey, hey you paid for this. You know, we, we paid for it and we now own it. And the natives would go, well, don't care. We're taking it back and... Um, uh, and then that would lead to conflict, as, as you can imagine. So, so this conflict between a, a society that had contract law and, and property ownership to one that had absolutely no concept of that or, and uh, ha had no um, history or culture of it, then, then that was bound to lead to conflict. I don't think anyone can be, be surprised in that. But the idea that there was this idyllic world um, where, where the natives lived is, is nonsense. They stole from each other. And murderously killed each other and sacrificed each other. Um, uh, the Aztecs, the Incas, would would uh, keep someone alive when they tore out their, their beating heart and that that sort of thing. And so you got somebody screaming in absolute agony while their their beating heart is held up by some uh, some equivalent of a, a, a sacrificial priest. So so the idea that's idyllic is just just simply nonsense, utter nonsense. Some of the North American Indian tribes were um, incredibly barbaric, um, and uh, you know by any standard, the uh, and, and when the, um, uh, the the Europeans were going around the the various islands in Asia and parts of Asia, they were looking at practices that even the hardiest of them perceived as as quite barbaric. You know, in in the Indian subcontinent, um, if a husband died, they would. Um, burn his wife alive um, and uh, you know these these sorts of things were uh, were, were widely widely practiced and the Europeans just sought to to put a stop to it so the idea of the wicked evil barbaric Europeans and the peaceful sweet loving harmonious natives is utter utter crap and the the, the again the property issue came up but there's a, a wider issue here in, in from a technological point of view most of the the peoples that the Europeans were coming across were technologically at least um, close to five thousand years behind the Europeans, if not more. Um, you know the the, uh, the 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 metallurgy of, of say the one of the very dominant African tribes, the Zulus. The level of metallurgy in terms of technology they they'd achieved was um, had been achieved. Um, you know, two two and a half thousand years previously, um, um, in uh, around the Mediterranean basin, uh, a lot of these societies didn't have the wheel. Um, a lot of the very basic building blocks of technical uh, progress and social organisation and so on 
um, that, that the West had, the, these places that the, the Western um, uh, seafarers were going to, they had none of this technology. Some, most of them were, were even, even you'd call them as early Stone Age in, in terms of their, uh, their, um, uh, their technology and their understanding of technology and, and so on. Um, and it even it even went further than that. It it, it, it was when when the Stone Age nomadic hunter gatherers, the villages by definition are going to be very small. Um, even a hundred people will be considered quite a large settlement in these places. So and they were moving around. So the the visiting Europeans could travel for many days, weeks in some cases, and not see a single person in the entire continent of Australia. There were less than a million. A million inhabitants um, when the white folk showed up. Similarly, in the United States, the the entire population, uh, Indian North American Indian population, um, was less than the population today of New York City, and and, and so on. So, so so they weren't they were very sparsely, very sparsely populated, and um, the land wasn't being used, or very very small parts were being used for anything productive. So. A society that that was built around sedentary farming w would turn up and see there were millions of acres of very arable, very good quality land that were available for agriculture. Um, so why not use it? Um, and why not put it to good use? And the, yeah, the, there were some things where the, uh, the things like the bison and whatnot were displaced in in North America, which did cause some hardship for the the local indigenous tribes. Um, so these need things need to be recognised, but the, the idea of putting land to productive use, um, land that otherwise wasn't being used or wasn't being put to any use, then that seems sensible then and, and seems sensible today. There are some things that, that didn't work out so well. The European diseases took a heavy toll of the, uh, of the natives of the, the, the Caribbean and also uh, of North America and indeed South America as well. So... This had a had a major effect on uh, on relations, the the, the bringing of, of diseases. Um, not that Europeans weren't still dying from these diseases, uh, you know, smallpox and so on they were, but um, the resistance that the Europeans had started to build up to these things, the natives in the Americas and South America, they had no resistance to that, and so they they um, they died in the same sort of numbers as when smallpox first appeared amongst the white populations in Europe. So. Um, and and the, there were a lot of lot of um, uh, deaths there as a result of that contact. Now, we, we need to understand and, and appreciate that because the Europeans were technically more advanced, as I say, in, in the case of metallurgy, you know, thousands of years, the wheel, all these sorts of things, because Europeans were, were more advanced technologically uh, and had uh, ocean-going, long-range sailing vessels, they were able to visit these places and set up trading posts and, and, and become settlers in some places, such as North America. Um, they chose not to settle widely in places that were already well populated. So, say in the case of um, um, you know, the Dutch trading posts in, in and around what, what would be modern day Indonesia, used to be referred to as Batavia back in the day, but they, uh, they would build a small fort and like a trading centre with a, a, a small uh, a town square that was, well, I don't know, the, one, the ones I've seen are probably 100 metres by 100 metres or thereabouts, uh, and they would settle some, some of the people in there. They would build a, a fortified port or harbour, and, um, and that would be it. They wouldn't really venture much beyond that. Uh, so, um, and if they did, they would be sort of armed... Um, their squads going somewhere to do something, then coming back to the the fort. So it was there as a as a, a trading post, and um, so and you see the same thing. For example, in New York, the Dutch trading post in in um, in New York, uh, which you know, much of which is still there today, and one of the original governors, of course, being Peter Stuyvesant. So these these trading posts um, were. Put, put all around the place. The, the Portuguese had some in China and uh, 
um, and the Spanish had them in the Philippines, and uh, as the Dutch did, and, and so on. Around the uh, around the globe, there were these small trading posts, but not everywhere were they attempting to settle. And the more populated the area was, the less likely that Europeans would settle. So they they weren't intent on um, elbowing out the local population if the local population had any sort of concept of property ownership. But this is different where the Europeans came, places like Australia, North America, Canada, the concept of property ownership wasn't there. The populations of natives were very, very small relative to the land size. And there was a lot of land available that wasn't um, seen as being owned by the people that may you know, the hunter-gatherers that nomadically used it. So this idea that the white people stole it is is, uh, is crap. The, the logic they use is, well, you know, the native people were there first, then the white came along, and therefore it must be theft. Now, that's, that's absolute nonsense. The same could be said of universities, that uh, sensible people were once running universities. Now crazy lunatic idiots are, are running it, so the crazy lunatic idiots stole it from the sensible people. We, we could use those arguments as well. In fact, that would be a valid argument, come to think of it. But, but anyway, the, the, this idea of, of um, the theft of the land and so on, and, uh, uh, and the, um, uh, the, the, the therefore the, the whole thing was racist is, is similarly nonsense. I mean, if, if uh, look at the way the elites perceive the so-called rednecks in the United States today, they're uneducated, they're illiterate, they're behind, they don't know anything, they're idiots and morons. Um, and so on and so forth, and they do that over their own people who, who, who don't don't have a, a degree in in lesbian dance theory, and therefore they must be inferior, or because they live in rural areas and maybe the the family owns a farm, they must be inferior. So they're doing that in 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 America and all across the West today. Yet if if um, uh, the the early seafare Western seafarers came to a, a place where the the people there were 5,000 years behind were more than they were in the early Stone Age, then that's racist uh, and that's evil and it's wicked. But what the, the, the elite leftists are doing is sneering at their own countrymen because uh, they, they work on a farm, then, then that's fine. That, that's, that's how it should be. So the, the double standard there is, is completely absurd and quite fantastic. So it's quite reasonable if, if, uh, if people of a certain technology turn up uh, at a place where the people who are there already are of a vastly inferior technology um, and uh, have no concept and comprehension of the sophisticated social structuring that the, the Western has had, then you would view them as, as being childlike. Um, and, and this is something, by the way, that came across, not even Christopher Columbus, but, but many others, when they would look at these... Um, uh, uh, people they would they would see them as having given they had no concept of property ownership wealth acquisition they didn't have the same concept of avarice and the grasping that Europeans would have had and therefore the Europeans perceived whether it be the Australian Aborigine or the North American Indians or, or even the Caribbean uh, Indians they perceived them as being uh, without treachery um, and, and without um, without the uh, the the inherent need or intent to deceive and treacherously deceive and so on so so this was something that was noted and it would have made them appear by contrast it made them appear quite childlike um, and their their idea of communal ownership so they would happily share things um, with these people the Europeans. Um, they would have not not people outside the tribe necessarily, but they would share share things with the Europeans, and the Europeans, of course, aren't used to to that sort of sort of thing. You know, in places where you don't have a whole lot, you can't really sort of share too much. Um, but uh, but these Indians were happy to, to to share their bits and pieces. There are stories in in Australia where where the earlier the earlier arrivals, the early settlers, they would be fishing. And because they had to catch enough fish for, to feed maybe, um, you know, 100 people or whatever it was, the, the, uh, the local Aborigines would perceive that all the fish in the world existed in that, that lagoon. And therefore, if you took too many fish, there would never be any fish again. Uh, and they had no concept of wider oceans and seas and, and things like that. Uh, the fish would be travelling 
hundreds if not thousands of miles to get there and, and spawn and, and the like so so they they um, would start attacking the attacking the uh, the white folks and say well you're taking too many fish there won't be any any fish left for us so again this communal thing comes in of make sure there's enough for everybody in 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 the area and and that was a little bit different from the europeans but their comprehension of of because um, they didn't didn't have farms and produce things and create things again they were stone age people then their concept of of um of the, the bounty of the land was very different from from uh, a european's concept given the much broader view so so given given all all those things we we, we need to sort of view colonialism in a in a different light um, it was trading or it was taking land that was um, or occupying or planting or cropping land that was was unused and had no other use and wasn't being put to any other use so in that sense the idea of, of theft is um, is quite absurd the third area of colonial uh, colonial uh, uh, sort of trading and, and colonial empires was and we can see examples of this in, say, the Indian subcontinent and other places, but, but I'll use this one as an example. Um, the, uh, the French and the, uh, the um, British, the Dutch and so on, were all around the subcontinent at various times, but they would, uh, um, they would agree in advance to come along and buy a certain amount of, of spice, for example, and um, they would have to uh, arrange a fleet to come back the following year through all sorts of storms and hazards and pirates and goodness knows what. It was a major investment. It was a huge undertaking. And they they pay in advance um, for some of this, like a down payment. Then they'd arrive and the Indian trader would, would think, well, I, I've got them. I, you know, they've, they've, they've got no choice. They've come all this way. Uh, I'm going to double the price. And too bad if they don't like it. Now this incensed the Europeans, and um, and, and they, they quite rightly saw this as as a, an act of treachery. So they would um, they would uh, threaten to um, use their cannons to to um, you know blow up the town or, or shoot up the village or something like that. Uh, but the the, uh, the 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 guys in the subcontinent, the the people who were doing the negotiating, usually took these things. That they had the habit of making these dire threats, which were simply posturing and um, brinksmanship to try and move the negotiating position along. But the the Europeans were in no mood for that, so assuming they even understood it, so they they um, would uh, start shooting up the, the town and the cannons. Then the the um, uh, the uh, they then get the price that um, had been initially agreed to, or even a further discount for the aggravation that they'd suffered. So, so those things were going on. The other thing too was that, that a lot of these places in the subcontinent was a particularly good example of this, as were parts of China. There was a lot of civil war and, and little little um, fiefdoms at war with each other over over the, the most trivial th um, you know, issues of disrespecting and and uh, and so on. So when the Europeans would come along to try and collect the uh, you know the spices there would be all these these petty wars going on and if they sent out just the just the the wagons to pick up the load that they'd probably be killed and often were killed along the way so then they had to provide armed escorts and uh, and sometimes these escorts would be overwhelmed by sheer numbers of, of native um, goons and heavies so then they they thought okay well that's not going to work we we have to have a military presence we don't care if they want to war on each other as long as they don't get in the way of our trading and our business um, then then we kind of don't really care but the these petty wars tribal wars and things would go on so the the europeans decided well, there's nothing for it we've we've just got to we've, we've got to install our own government in effect we, we've got to put someone in place who's who's not going to make war on the other guy so we can keep the peace and we can keep things quiet so we can go about our business and so they would start start occupying areas or in, installing agreeable uh, governors from the local natives or, or you know, kings and rajas and so on uh, and and this ended up in them having to annex uh, and um, uh, uh, really take take direct governmental control of some of these areas if anything, to stop the constant drama. Now, if you look at India today, there's constant religious and political 
um, and tribal strife going on. It's, it's kind of, I mean, we, we forget that it, it's not reported in the news. They, they have these riots where hundreds of people are killed. Um, now, that was going on probably to an even greater scale when the Europeans turned up. And given this, this, this drama and warfare and, and these you know, religious killings and everything were, were so frequent, the Europeans felt that, again, for business alone, they just had to, they just had to do something. And, and so they annexed uh, or took over these places. But the intention wasn't to annex or make it part of an empire. The intention was to, to stop barriers and obstacles to, to doing business. So I think that'll give you a, a wider summary there of, of what the colonial sort of world looked like. And, and it was, I, I guess there's a final thing too about, about annexing and empires was that uh, a lot of the European powers were attempting to do it. So the European power A would say, well, if we don't do it, the, the guys down the road will. So we better um, lay a claim to this area and that'll at least keep them out, out of the, the way. So, but that'll give you a wider view of, of, of the colonial thing and also give you an understanding of how absurd and ridiculous this constant denigration of, of the colonial empires uh, was and, and still is. Uh, but also I give you an appreciation of how the, the, um, the arrival of, of Europeans um, brought technology and legal structures and social organisation to people that may have still, to this day, been without the wheel and living in the Stone Age. You've been with Tasslis today, a pushback channel. Thank you for listening.